guys, Professor Jeff here. Uh, I got a big video lecture for you today. We're going to be going over uh, John Rawls, Friedrich Nietzsche, and Eric Fromm. So this is going to be like the last of our moral theorists for the first section of the class. Uh, so this is kind of like a big wrap-up. I'm going to go over these three thinkers individually, and I'm also going to review a little bit of the key terms that all of our moral philosophers have defined up until this point. All right, so hang on. Here we go. All right, so up first here we have John Rawls, who's really the only uh, American philosopher that we're looking at, and he's actually pretty contemporary, too. He was writing in the 1990s. He actually just died in 2002. But uh, Rawls here gives us uh, another definition of justice that's actually quite different than the one that we get from Plato. Right? If we remember, Plato says that justice is essentially minding your own business whether it's the three classes of society or the three parts of the soul, each must mind their own business in order to foster a sense of justice. But for Rawls, uh, justice is really just the first virtue of social institutions. So let's keep in mind the difference here between his and Plato's definition of justice. Plato saw justice occurring on individual and social levels, while Raw Rawls sees justice purely as a social issue. Uh, so what is justice? Uh, he actually says that we need to agree collectively upon what justice means in a given society. And he gives us this fun little thought experiment here called the veil of ignorance. And he says the veil of ignorance is this idea that we can forget uh, all of our strengths and advantages and our our personal quirks and things like that, and that in forgetting those, we'll be able to fairly decide upon some principles of what justice should be in a society. So just to follow the line of the argument here, uh, justice is a virtue of social institutions, but it must be collectively agreed upon by the members of that society while they are behind the veil of ignorance, while we forget our strengths, weaknesses, and individual characteristics. Uh, so, to wrap up, he kind of says there are these two principles of justice that he imagines that we would come to if we made our decision behind this veil. He says that the first is that there would be equal rights and liberties for everyone. Fair enough. We have this already. This is kind of the Bill of Rights. Uh, and the second one, which is a little more complicated, kind of interesting here, is that if inequalities should exist in a society, they would benefit everybody and be open to everybody. So sometimes this can be a little tough to wrap our heads around. What kind of an inequality benefits everybody? Well, one of the most used example here, one of the most used examples are doctors, right? So... Uh, doctors earn a little bit more money than most other people. They also have to go to school longer than a lot of other people. But as a society, we really all benefit from the existence of medical doctors. So there are other examples of this, uh, and it's really fun to think about what some of those might be and whether or not the inequalities that already exist within society are, in fact, to everyone's benefit. Uh, but this is all stuff that you guys can write about in a paper. Next up, we have Friedrich Nietzsche, who is a German philosopher from the 1800s. And, uh, oh, there is a lot that we could talk about here. Uh, we could spend a whole semester talking about the different things that he brings up and how he's typically misunderstood and everything like that. But we really just have a couple of things that are important for this class. Uh, so we were looking at a little selection from his book titled The Gay Science. Uh, and in that selection, we have a few different really big uh, ideas to examine here. Uh, the first one is where he talks about evil as really just things that are new. Things that are considered evil, he says, are typically just new ideas that we haven't acclimated to, that we don't understand yet. So the newness of them makes us view them as evil. And then eventually we get used to these ideas 
and we regard them as being good, and then the next new thing that comes up is then regarded as evil. So uh, we'll just follow this kind of train of thought here and see how this becomes a big project in moral skepticism. But the, the next big thing, big idea that we can examine here uh, is this whole God is dead quote that he is quite infamous for saying. Uh, so this really has two different kinds of meanings to it here. It's obviously not literal, right? Uh, whether or not you believe in God, you know, is being dead is not really something that can happen either way. Uh, but the idea is that there is no objective moral standard that comes from uh, a deity like God, right? Because if God does exist, he is determined what is morally good and we just follow that, uh, that idea. Uh, that's one of the ways that we can interpret this quote. Uh, the other one has to do with our belief in God, because Nietzsche was writing shortly after, uh, after Darwin wrote his book on the origin of species and the theory of evolution became very popularized. He essentially said that with our new understanding of science, we can no longer believe in a god the same way that people did before then. Okay, so this this little statement here that gets, uh, you know, popularized uh, has these other meanings that we can really understand by examining the philosophical and historical context of the book in which it is written. Uh, and finally, we have this thought experiment of the eternal recurrence of the same. And this is that thing right at the end of the reading where he's talking about if you were, you know, in your bed one night and a demon comes up to you and says you're going to live the rest of your life over and over again exactly the same as you've lived it now, you know, how would you feel about that? And for him this is kind of a thought experiment in what he calls life affirmingness, right? How happy are you with your life, with life in general. And he thinks this is a good way to determine whether or not we're living the right way. And, you know, again, this comes back to this idea of moral skepticism, okay? So just to define this, right, he's skeptical. He's not sure whether or not morality is a thing that really exists, or if it's a thing that we just make up and go along with, right? So if Things that are new are considered evil, and that's all that evil really is. And uh, God isn't the one determining our moral values and objective morality for everyone. And, you know, we should really decide what a good decision is based on how we feel about it and whether or not we're happy with that decision. Uh, you can kind of see how all of this comes around to his questioning the nature of morality in general. Okay? And this is a position that's closely related, but not exactly moral relativism, which we're going to see with Eric Fromm in the next section of the video. All right, last up we have uh, Eric Fromm, who is a German psychologist, really, from the 1900s. So Fromm is really our best example of a moral relativist, so to define moral relativism very briefly, it's just the idea that morality does exist just according to different standards in different places, at different times, maybe just by different individuals. Uh, so Fromm sees morality or ethics as existing according to these two general standards here. They're either humanistic or authoritarian. And he says that the way to tell whether or not a uh, set of ethics is humanistic or authoritarian is that in humanistic ethics people get to decide for themselves what's good and what they're deciding is going to be good for themselves. Simple enough. In authoritarian ethics the authority figure is the one deciding what is good and what they're deciding on is ultimately good for the authority more so than the people. Okay, uh, But then he actually breaks down this idea of authority into these two different categories here. He believes that there is a rational authority and irrational authority. So when we're talking about authoritarian ethics, 
says we're really talking about irrational authority and the power that it wields over people, where rational authority is actually compatible with humanistic ethics, right? So he doesn't say that all authority is bad, just that there is a kind that is not so good for us, uh, and another kind that might be more compatible with this uh, form of humanistic ethics. So to distinguish between rational and irrational authority, it says that rational authority is based in the competence of the authority figure, and that that authority is in fact questionable. People can question it. They can say, are you sure about this? How do you know about this, right? And I think one of the best examples that we have here is a good teacher. A good teacher is a rational authority on a specific subject matter because they are competent in that subject matter and their students should be able to ask questions of them. Uh, on the other hand, we have irrational authorities. Irrational authority rules through power and fear as opposed to competence, and their dictates are unquestionable. We are not allowed to ask whether or not they are right or wrong. Okay, uh, so that is what we have here. Let's remember this is the moral relativist position uh, and yeah, that is that. We'll go into a little bit of review next. So just to do a big review of all of the moral philosophers that we've covered so far, I really want you guys to be able to uh, keep these thinkers and their terms in mind and the different ways that they approach morality as we move into our section where we actually look at specific moral issues because they're not necessarily going to talk about these specific people and their specific ideas. Sometimes they will, but we need to try to understand the arguments that they're making in terms of these ideas and to be able to form counter arguments and critiques of those in terms of other versions of these, right? The way that we could see that Kant and Mill will approach different, well, the same moral problem completely differently. We want to be able to do that on our own with the different moral uh, problems that we're going to be looking at. So, to begin, we have Plato on justice, right? He has the individual and the social definitions of justice. Uh, Aristotle writes about virtue, which is really an individual moral theory. He doesn't talk about society as a whole, and it's also quite absolute. There's really no other standard for him. It's just virtue, and the golden mean, right? Kant talks about the categorical imperative, which is a deontological approach to morality. Remember, deontology is a moral system based on following rules, okay? So this is an absolutist form of morality that he argues occurs both on individual and social levels. Mostly, uh, it's mostly individual, but uh, let's not forget the part in the reading where he talks about the kingdom of ends. So he does believe that there is a basis for this occurring in society as a whole. So next up, we have John Stuart Mill with his idea of utilitarianism, which is ultimately a consequentialist form of morality, right? It values the consequences of our actions in determining their morality more than the motivation or whether or not we're following rules. Right? And this is a little bit more of a relative moral theory that he also believes takes place on individual and social levels. Right? So we just saw uh, Rawls, too. You know, Rawls has his definition of justice that's quite different from Plato's, uh, which is a 100% you know, a social definition of justice, and a little bit more relative as he gives us room to decide for ourselves what the principles of justice are. He just argues that there are two that he imagines that we would pick. Uh, so then we have Nietzsche, who is just a moral skeptic, right? He doesn't think morality really exists. We should just act in ways that are going to make ourselves happy. Uh, and he doesn't even really define what that is for us. Just kind of do what you want. Don't worry about what others think, etc. And finally, we have Eric Fromm, who wrote about humanism and authoritarianism as two different moral frameworks, right? Which makes him a moral relativist, right? Moral relativism 
is this idea, once again, that morality can exist in different ways for different people at different times in different situations. All right, so make sure you have this all written down. Don't forget we have a quiz coming up, so make sure you understand all of these guys, and uh, I will see you next time. All right, that is it for today. We went over John Rawls' theory of justice as fairness. We went over Nietzsche's moral skepticism from the gay science. And we did Eric Fromm's uh, moral relativism in terms of uh, humanistic ethics and authoritarian ethics, as well as a big old review of all of our moral philosophers and their terminology thus far. Uh, so I hope you took notes. Uh, Rewatch again if you want to. And uh, we'll see you next time.